Welcome everybody to the press briefing hosted by the Science Media Center in Germany on behalf of the COVID-19 Vaccine Media Hub, a global information project of the network of international science media centers and their partners. My name is Volker Stolotz from the SMC Germany. And we have, uh, are proud to have a, a group of distinguished experts today. And uh, we will have uh, room for questions. And um, I just want to briefly introduce, so while in many affluent countries, people are already receiving third COVID-19 booster vaccinations, in many low-income countries, healthcare workers and even the most vulnerable people are still waiting to receive the first shot of any of the available COVID-19 vaccines. We see emerging new variants like Omicron, we heard news of today, the world wakes up to the fact that unless we are all protected against severe disease, no country can feel safe because escape mutants will evolve and transmit more easily between countries. And uh, we will briefly discuss this kind of experts today and your questions. Uh, the briefing will be recorded, transcribed and posted on our website as soon as possible. Put your questions uh, you may have in the Q&A tool of Zoom and my colleague will forward them and I will ask them to the experts. If you have specific questions, uh, Teresa Lamb has to uh, move on in half an hour. So we will try to be uh, quick in the uh, start so that she can answer questions you may have. So I will uh, first introduce the panel. We have Associate Professor Teresa Lamb. She's Associate Professor and Leading Investigator at the General Institute, University of Oxford, UK. Welcome. Then we have Professor Annelise Wilder-Smith, Professor of Emerging Infectious Disease, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And she's also an advisor of the Initiative for Vaccine Research at the World Health Organization, Geneva, Switzerland. Then we have on the left, uh, Florian Klammer, Professor of Vaccinology at the Department of Microbiology, Icon School of Medicine at the Mount Sinai, New York, USA. And we have uh, Jacob Kramer, Physician in Internal Medicine, Tropical Medicine, Infectious Disease, Head of Clinical Development Coalition of, for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, CP. I will start with Teresa Lump. So uh, tomorrow, one year ago, the first patient in the UK was kind of uh, vaccinated. Uh, uh, was it a vaccine uh, approved at the time and um, uh, developed by the Jenner Inst uh, Institute in collaboration with AstraZeneca? And one year on, already 2 billion doses of this vaccine uh, against the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2 uh, and an adrenal virus vector vaccine has been distributed uh, worldwide. Can you tell us a little bit how the rollout is going in less developed countries and what is happening right there at the moment and uh, what the situation is? Um, certainly. So I'm an academic. Um, I've worked on making vaccines against emerging and outbreak pathogens for a number of years now. Um, at the University of Oxford, we've been fully committed to ensuring the vaccine that we developed would be provided globally and equitably. And we partnered with AstraZeneca to this end. As you've mentioned, worldwide, there's been about 2 billion doses of the Oxford AZ vaccine distributed, with over 7.6 billion doses of vaccines being given out in the world. Um, unfortunately, only 6.3% of low, middle, uh, low income countries have received vaccines. Um, and we need to do more. Over two thirds of our vaccine, the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine is going to low and lower middle income countries. But really, I think the, the emphasis is on us uh, worldwide to try and get more vaccines globally. We spend trillions of dollars um, on defense against each other and we don't spend or have the same investment in protecting each other. That needs to change or we'll continue to be in this cycle of fighting new and variant um, viruses continuously. Yeah, um, there were concerns in some developed uh, countries about the very rare side effect of this specific uh, adrenal viral vector vaccine. Is there any data or reports from the less developed countries so far in terms of uh, what you get as a feedback? Yes, so I, I think you've hit the nail on the head by calling it a very rare side effect. Um, it was not picked up in the thousands and thousands of individuals we tested in the UK, South Africa, or Brazil, or in the US. There does seem to be a, a higher instance of this, but still very rare side effect in Northern European countries. We're not seeing the same level of reporting of this TTS in other countries. Okay, thanks for now. So now we'll move on to Professor Annelise Wilder-Smith. 
And as the real lump uh, just said, uh, virtually no low income countries is on track to vaccinate 40% of the population this year, the goal set by the WHO. Um, and many will miss the 20% mark, COVAX set as a minimum by the end of 2021. And uh, can you comment a little bit on where we stand with vaccinating the world? We just heard how important that is and the new Omicron variant, uh, of course, makes that obvious. Um, can you just comment on where we stand and why we stand where we stand and uh, what that means for the near future and these new variants coming? So let's start with the good news first. The, the good news is that more than 8 billion doses have been administered and that now 54% of the world's population has received a first dose and about 42% have received two doses. That's, that is good news, and it is really a public health victory and also a political victory in, in, in many sense. But there's also the bad news. The bad news is that the vaccine distribution remains um, not fairly distributed, inequitable, with a lot, many of the low to middle income countries uh, with very low vaccine coverage rates for various reasons. Uh, with, with some other countries hoarding uh, vaccines and now uh, more eight times more booster doses being given over a first dose. And some countries have not even started vaccinating yet. So the current call is really, you know, we need to accelerate. We need to accelerate further production, vaccine supply, but we also need to accelerate vaccine delivery. It's not only now about vaccine supply. It's yeah. also about vaccine demand and vaccine delivery. So what are the major bottlenecks in the uh, delivery, uh, which you see? I heard from some countries who kind of uh, refuse uh, supply exceeds uh, to just import because they are not able or capable or feel not capable to do the logistics of the distribution to basically get the vaccines into the arms of the people, because that's basically what we aim at, not just producing vaccines, but giving them to, to the people in need first. So what are the bottlenecks? There, there are many, many bottle, bottlenecks. So first of all, we have to acknowledge it's a very challenging um, task to quickly roll out vaccines to a population that we normally do not vaccinate, and that's the older adults. I know all countries are used to and have systems in place for their childhood vaccination programs, but really do not have systems in place. How, how do you really get access to, to older populations? Older populations in, you know, in villages may not come forward. Older populations may not be uh, as, as, as literate or computer literate to really know that they have to come forward. This vaccine is also not easy just to deliver from house to house like we did for the oral polio vaccine. Um, so it needs much more logistics. Um, it, it, it needs creative new approaches, how now to reach those most vulnerable and that's the older people. Um, and so, so all these programmatic delivery issues need to be in place at a time um, um, and, and very rapidly. And furthermore, there's, there's another complicating factor is that many countries actually cannot totally predict when the vaccine supply arrives or they have you know, on and off a vaccine supply, they expected a vaccine supply, it didn't come, they were prepared, it didn't come, or suddenly it comes and they're not prepared. So there are uh, multiple factors that make deliver delivery so difficult in some of those low to middle income countries. So indeed, it's not only vaccine supply now, that was maybe a year ago, now it is about how can we help them also with vaccine delivery? Yeah, we come back to that in the Q&A session. I move over to uh, Professor Florian Klammer. Klammer, and uh, you have a good overview on the different vaccines which are already uh, uh, delivered worldwide. And uh, from your vaccinology view of the emerging variants of SARS-CoV-2, like the Omicron, where we have seen first data just today coming out about uh, uh, neutralizing antibody uh, capabilities, um, how, how, how good will these different types fare against uh, the ongoing evolution of this virus? virus? Your statement. Yeah, that's a good question, which is, uh, you know, any answer to that would 
is is basically pure speculation but we do see performance differences right there is a very nice study in brazil for example where astrazeneca was compared to coronavac and you could see that the astrazeneca vaccine was doing better the coronavac vaccine was working too but the vaccine effectiveness was lower right uh, we also know <clears throat> if you look at neutralizing antibody titers some vaccines induce lower titers than others um, some vaccines have more ability to in induce t cell responses than others right and so the, the vaccines that I'm more worried about right now are vaccines that are one-shot vaccines uh, and vaccines that uh, are basically inactivated vaccines that um, by their nature don't necessarily give you a, a, a good diesel response and might induce low neutralizing antibody titers. I think that's where I, I would assume that the, 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 you know, the effectiveness goes down the most. Um, for vaccines that give good T cell responses or that induce very high neutralizing antibody titers, I'm, I'm a little bit less worried. But again, this is speculation. We need to wait for the yeah. data. And right now, we don't even have data, uh, effectiveness data against uh, with, with, with vaccines uh, like uh, BioNTech, Pfizer, or, or Moderna. Yeah, and that's a very important point you raised about these uh, inactivated whole virus vaccines, because there are kind of from China, for example, we have these uh, vaccines given to a lot or lots of people also in Africa and in, in South America. And your point is that uh, compared to these newer RNA uh, vaccines, you expect them to be uh, less protective, if I understand it correctly. Um, again, speculation, but that's what I would expect. There are differences between the inactivated vaccines too. Uh, there seems to be data that, uh, for example, the Sinopharm vaccine is doing a little bit better than the CoronaVac vaccine. So there are differences also between the inactivated vaccines. Um, but that would be what I would what I would uh, suspect. Um, again, inactivated vaccines are typically not good vaccines to induce these responses. And I mean, we have all seen now uh, some data sets. Uh, from from Alex Egal's lab, from Sandra Cizek's lab, that neutralization uh, is basically, you know, the, the Omicron is a very strong escape uh, variant when it comes to in vitro neutralization, right? And so we might need to rely on, or our immune system might need to rely on safety nets like T cell responses, like non neutralizing antibody responses, like anamnestic responses from the B cell compartment, right? Um, but the lower your baseline status is, the less antibody you have, the less of a T cell response you have, the easier it will be for a strong escape mutant uh, like Omicron like it is uh, to, to kind of cause disease, right? So I, I think that's what we have to keep in mind and we have to be honest. It's not that all vaccines are equal. We do see differences. Mm -hmm. Okay, then we move on to uh, Jakob Kramer from CP. Um, so CP is kind of uh, looking into the future of what novel vaccine types we are kind of going to need in the future, not just today, uh, where we're trying to roll out as fast as possible the existing vaccines. Uh, what can, can you tell us a little bit about what type of vaccines you are actually testing right now in phase one, phase two, and how that could impact on these uh, newly emerging uh, viruses uh, which come up at the moment or may come up in the future? Yeah, thank you for, for this question. I, I would also like to start with good news. Um, vaccines work. Vaccines work against severe disease for the variants so far. Omicron, we'll see further data emerging over the next days and weeks. But I would like to start with saying that it is important that we understand what we expect from those vaccines. And um, we still have a good vaccine efficacy against severe disease, whether or not we maintain efficacy against any severity or maybe even transmission, or at the very best end against infection even, um, that is to be seen. But as long as we keep our kind of um, hospitals uh, out of from, away from compensation with good vaccines against severe disease, we have already an important um, you know, step forward. Now we need to see moving forward if this is maintained. So in light of the different objectives in relation to vaccine efficacy that which I just mentioned, we the two most important characteristics I think that we need to look into moving forward is to maintain vaccine efficacy against severe disease and to have a broad coverage against new variants that may emerge. 
So these are probably the two most important characteristics that we need to look into moving forward with the second generation or future um, or adapted vaccines. There is a few additional characteristics. Um, Florian mentioned already that we need to understand the immune system or protective immune response better. Right now, regulatory pathways are primarily based on neutralizing antibody titers. Um, and if we see an escape variant, you may have really very high antibody titers, but they're gone if they no longer work you know, against the new variant. But yeah. We maintain other functions within the immune system, T cell mediated immune responses, other immune responses that, that may maintain a certain protection against at least severe disease. So this is something that we need to look into more broadly moving forward. But obviously there's a few additional characteristics um, in terms of improving the longevity of the protective immunity, single dose regimen, maybe even intranasal formulations that have a better protection against transmission or even infection. Uh, and then also to speak about other characteristics like shelf life, um, storage conditions, uh, and so on that reflect the situations in low income countries or tropical areas is something that uh, we look at. But again, I'd like to mention the broad coverage against newly emerging variants, so-called broadly protective beta coronavirus vaccines is something that CEPI has a focus on. Yeah. Okay, then I would start um, giving you the questions. I think I will start with Teresa Lamb. And um, uh, the very simple question is, is the team of uh, uh, the uh, um, AstraZeneca vaccine already working on vaccine adaptions uh, related to a post potential Omicron uh, variant vaccine, whether that's needed or not? What is your considerations at the moment? So I would echo what Florian and Jakob have already said. We don't know if we need a new vaccine yet. Um, it is very, very likely that we will see a fall in neutralizing antibodies. Um, we have yet to come across a variant where we've seen an impact on protection against hospitalization and death. And unfortunately, we need to be a little patient to see the results from those types of, for that data to come out. Um, we, like other vaccine manufacturers, can go fast. We've already made a different variant vaccine, AZD2816, against beta. So we've got the processes and the willpower to go fast if we need to. We don't know yet. Can you comment for the uh, journalists out there, um, and also Florian maybe, how long will it take before we can make an informed decision whether or not we really have to move uh, and switch uh, uh, to another uh, variant type uh, booster vaccine. I mean, yes. when will this data emerge? Two weeks or one month or? Certainly the data that is coming at the moment from South Africa is largely encouraging because the data that is being reported is that it's a generally mild disease. The caveats are that we're looking at a population that is much longer, much is much younger They've had an exposure to different types of variants, and I'm not sure that we've given enough time for us to be able to accumulate the data on hospitalization. So I think we need to wait a little bit longer before we can be fully confident of what the data is telling us. Florian? I agree. I mean, we need to, to wait and look, but while we wait and look, I think the vaccine manufacturers need to move and make a vaccine that can be used if it's needed, because we have to keep the timelines in mind. Um, Moderna is moving now. They said that they might be able to deliver something in March that depends on the regulatory pathways used that might come mid next year. And then uh, if Omicron continues to spread, Omicron waves might be over in most countries. Yeah. So I think for the vaccine producers right now, the most important thing is to get going and to talk to regulatory agencies and find out how to get this to the market fast if needed. If we don't need it in the end, that's great. I, I would I would love to be over with it. And if, if vaccine effectiveness against severe disease or even moderate disease holds up, I would be super happy. And I think that's kind of all we need. But we don't know that. And to wait uh, and see is, for us, I think that's important. But um, for the vaccine manufacturers, if they wait and see, that means that there will be long delays. And I don't think we can risk those long delays, honestly. 
Yeah. Before I come back to Omicron, I just wanted to uh, um, put the question maybe to Annalise uh, Walter Smith that, that is developed countries like Germany and other countries also are rolling out uh, booster programs and we are kind of speeding it up. And uh, should this be stopped now in light of the uh, goal of worldwide vaccinations? And how, how does uh, WHO seize it? Because um, uh, Omicron may uh, call for an update. So is it more important to keep on uh, pressing worldwide vaccinations? And is there not a new dilemma between boosting the rich countries and uh, have, giving access to uh, low-income countries with uh, the v vaccines they need to protect the vulnerable people? But how do you see it? So the, the clear message is we need more first dose coverage, higher first dose coverage, more people need to be vaccinated. But you get a much bigger public health impact in terms of averting deaths and hospitalizations, the more people have received the first and second dose. That said, um, Europe and many other countries are now in the winter season and they're seeing a major resurgence. And we have seen the positive impact of a third dose on restoring vac vaccine effectiveness. And all governments have a duty to, to uh, protect their own citizens. So we are here in a tension. Um, and, and so indeed, we need to go in parallel whilst we, whilst we roll out more boosters, especially for the vulnerable who have a higher risk of dying. We must make sure that we have also a broader and higher uh, coverage with first and second doses in, in the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question probably for Jacob Kramer, and that is concerning uh, these uh, plans of a uh, one euro vaccine. So putting down the price to get more um, uh, vaccines out more fast to vaccinate the whole world, because it seems with all these ever increasing new variants, uh, we would uh, need a big effort, effort to basically uh, reach, uh, yeah, well, m most of the world population and not just in specific countries. Is it feasible or realistic or what needs to be done to, to bring this um, number of vaccines to the people? Yes, of course, this is important, um, but we should not uh, address too many aspects in parallel. First of all, we need good vaccines and we need to have enough vaccine and we need um, distribution capacities uh, and so on. Um, CEPI in its calls for new vaccines, second generation vaccines, broadly protective beta coronavirus vaccines looks into the so-called cost of goods. This is certainly one of the aspects that we keep in mind if we do fund additional programs. Um, but first of all, we need good vaccines, you know, that tackle new variants, uh, maintain protective efficacy for those in need, while at the same time, you know, maintaining that discussion. CEPI has created a marketplace where we uh, connect developers with glass vial producers and um, fill finish capacities and so on um, to connect, but also to you know, the market, as you can imagine, is a little bit stretched at the moment, everyone needing glass vials and so on. So we try to, you know, keep this open and transparent and uh, um, to help to this end. Um, but obviously, the, the first priority will be um, enough of good vaccines, yeah. while at the same time looking at prices. And maybe to both of you, um, Annalise and uh, Jacob, how CP and VO, uh, WHO ensures can ensure faster reach of vaccine coverage? What are basically the thinking or the, what, what, what is being done right now to reach more people? Maybe you can both comment on that question to be a little bit more specific. And then I move on to Florian and the Omicron. We need to spend much more time into building up delivery capacity. That means more trained personnel, the uh, trained logistics, you know, all, all the background that is needed from fridges to, to syringes, it's not only about the vaccines um, to, to enable countries to roll out the vaccines, but it's also more than that. We also need, um, you know, um, national um, uh, deployment plans that are feasible and, and, and context specific. It may differ between Nigeria and Mongolia, for example, and, but also trying to focus. And that's very important, I think, Countries need to continue to focus on high priority groups. 
We hear from countries, including developing countries, that have started to vaccinate children. Whilst that is not the priority, the priority is, is vaccinate older people, vaccinate people that are at higher risk of severe disease outcomes. Um, so, so there's there's it's, it's a multi-pronged approach that we now need to do, and it's now far beyond vaccine supply. And the other issue is really vaccine demand. You know, the social media is also strong <laughs> and conspiracy theories are mushrooming also in low to middle income countries and also in Africa. And one of the reasons why the take up is not as high as we wish is also the demand issue. People do not want to give their arm. It's much easier to give a third dose to people who are already willing to have a first and second than to give a first dose to many. And we in Europe have failed miserably as well, or we in the US have failed miserably as well. We are also not as high. If you compare, um, Brazil has already overtaken most of Europe now. They were late, but they're now better. Um, Chile is very high, Mongolia, uh, Thailand have achieved very, and China has have achieved very high vaccination coverage rates. And also that said, New Zealand, I'm very impressed, 90%. So, so I, th I think the whole world needs to learn. It's not about high income countries are doing it better than low income countries. There are problems everywhere. The problems are different, but we need to tackle them in the con context specifically. Jacob, you want to add the CP perspective on this, how to move on fast. Yeah, I think Annelise has covered it well. Just to underline, there is vaccine skepticism, not just in high income countries, um, but also in low middle income countries, which is something that needs to be addressed. Just to add one point, um, the COVAX facility has, as we speak, delivered 623 million doses to low middle income countries so far, which is a big achievement, but it, which is not enough, certainly. So what we need is supply, direct supply of vaccines into the COVAX facility, not just maybe donations of vaccines, which, you know, have a limited shelf life, um, not used in high income countries, which then comes with delivery issues as well in low middle income countries and kind of some urgency to get them distributed. So we need um, cooperation support from governments, from developers. Um, we are prepared to deliver these vaccines. Okay, Florian, now to you and uh, the Omicron questions, of course, uh, lots of people are kind of worried and uh, have some questions. And uh, I start with the first, uh, what would it mean for the global vaccination campaign if the apparently more contagious Omicron variant displaces the dominant Delta variant worldwide? Uh, and then the question is, and I think maybe it's misplaced, but what would that be a good thing? Because Omicron is said to be potentially uh, lead to milder disease causes. As far as I know, this is not yet certain. What do you think? I mean, I think we can only speculate about this. Um, the, the, the notion that uh, Omicron uh, might be milder is based on some data from South Africa, and there's uh, all kinds of data from South Africa in, in terms of disease severity right now. And as Des already uh -huh. said, we have to be very careful here. Right. Uh, we're talking about a young population that has a very right. high baseline immunity from previous infection, and that's where we may be seeing a little bit of a milder uh, disease phenotype, maybe. Um, if if that hits a uh, non-vaccinated uh, older population somewhere else, I don't think uh, yeah. that, that, that the, we have to be careful. That might not hold true, right? So I think what we what we need to do as a base assumption right now is is to assume that Omicron is going to be very similar to other variants in terms of disease severity. Um, I can't really judge what that all would mean for global vaccination campaigns. Honestly, I, I'm not an expert in that, and um, I, I don't know what the best strategies would be if, uh, if it really replaces Delta. I think the bigger issue would be, or not the bigger issue, but an additional issue would be if there is a strong co-circulation of Delta and Omicron, because for people who have not been vaccinated right now, you would then have to make a choice of what vaccine to use if uh, really different vaccines are needed, right? Or, you know, you might have to develop bivalent vaccines. And so I see that as a, an additional complication. And uh, here's another question concerning this, uh, on the one hand, this booster dilemma we were just talking about. And um, if you could delve in a little bit more about the reasoning, if Omicron is uh, taking over rapidly, uh, should people even refrain from a booster dose shot? No, I guess you would say no, please don't. Uh, what is your opinion about this? There are many layers here, right? From a pure immunological point of view and from a 
I want to protect myself point of view, I, I think a booster dose is a very good idea. Uh, from an ethical point of view that was just discussed, that's a very different story. But I think we have to face reality. Uh, there are increasing numbers of Omicron cases in uh, several countries, right? We know that there might be a community transmission in several countries, but what we are facing right now, specifically in Europe and in North America, is a very strong Delta wave. And I think the most important thing would be to get those people vaccinated who haven't received the vaccine yet. The first shot, the second shot, those are the important ones right now. Um, yes, uh, I think a booster will, is, is doing great in, in, in helping to control infections, even in a Delta wave, because the protection against uh, infection goes up rapidly after the booster. But I'm more worried about the people who are not vaccinated yet. Those are really the ones who need to get vaccinated. Okay, um, then there's one more technical question, then I move on again to the other issues. Uh, could Omicron have evolved in a highly vaccinated population, or at least would it have been less likely to have evolved in a highly vaccinated population? That comes again, so where does this virus come from? And uh, has it had specific uh, ways of how it could evolve? What is your opinion? Of? I know you are not an expert on origins of new variants, but do you have an, uh, a vaccinology view on, on this question? I mean, there's a, a more broad global population uh, view, uh, and that basically says if you have more people vaccinated, you have fewer infections. And even when people have breaks from infections, there might be fewer replication cycles of the virus, and all that it decreases uh, the risk of getting new variants, right? Uh, but uh, there's another issue here, and, and we have seen that that's very well documented. There might be people who are immunosuppressed who are more persistently infected, and a lot of the mutations that we see in variants come up uh, in these persistent infections. This has been, as I said, well documented, um, and that is another way of, of in a way, how these variants uh, could, uh, could emerge, right? Um, but again, if the more people you vaccinate, the, 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 the more you restrict the circulation of the virus in the global population, the lower is the chance of getting a variant. Every replication cycle gives the virus a chance to uh, probe another degree, uh, another, another mutation and add another mutation. Every time it replicates is bad. And the more you vaccinate, the less global replication you get. Yeah. May I may I add to this? Yeah, of course. There, there is indeed a misconception, and we must clear that misconception. New variants emerge where you have a lot of virus circulation. The more virus you have, the higher like the higher the probability that you will have an emergence of a variant of concern. And all the variants so far have always emerged in areas where there was an incredible resurgence. So Alpha was in the UK during the time of a peak better in South Africa when they had an unvaccinated uh, outbreak, Delta uh, during, during in, in India when they had a major outbreak. New Zealand has no cases, hardly, has a 90% coverage rate, no emergence of any variant comes from New Zealand. And I think that's a message that needs to come across to people because that's, that's wrong messaging. That's part of the conspiracy theory that vaccination drives new escape mechanisms. No, the message is, they are driven because there's a lot of virus circulating. And, and just to give you a figure, and Florian may, may correct me, but I was told that an infected person with viremic may have up to 1 billion viruses. So you have a lot of people with 1 billion viruses. Yes, one of them will mutate. So we need to keep that done with broad coverage of vaccination. I understand that, but Florian, as I understood in South Africa, the incidence was down quite low. So nevertheless, Omicron uh, emerged uh, in that population where uh, not much, uh, at least not, yeah, they didn't see it or it wasn't there. I don't know. I would, as you said earlier, I'm not a, an expert yeah. of emergence of uh, variants, but we have to be very careful to say this emerged in South Africa. Yeah, I don't I think agree. we can actually yeah. prove that, right? Um, the virus, uh, if you if you really look at who detected it, where it was detected, uh, there were exports from all kinds uh, or yeah. all, all different types of countries from Africa. Um, and um, it's it's not clear uh, where that virus actually came from. Um, was detected in, in diplomats in Botswana. We don't know where they came from. Uh, it, 
there are probably even earlier cases in other places. I think we have to be careful to, to kind of jump to conclusions here. Jacob, you wanted to add something. Yes, so again, underlying that high vaccine coverage is key, of course, but new variants will always emerge in future in immunocompromised, for example. Stopping international flight is probably not going to prevent these variants from traveling around the globe. If you detect them somewhere, they're probably out of the country already. So I just wanted to underline again what I said initially, it is important to at least look at the maintenance of vaccine efficacy against severe disease, and also to look into the development of not just broad coverage of vaccinations, but also broad coverage of new variants with new vaccines. Yeah. Um, here's a question I don't know, um, um, it's Wilder Smith, whether you can answer it. If a vaccine producers uh, would start now, if we needed to produce a vaccine that is adapted against the Omicron strain, um, will this influence the ongoing production of uh, the uh, vaccines we are trying to distribute already? Or would there be a gap in production? And uh, would that uh, then de uh, decrease even vaccine outputs for uh, maybe even countries who, who need, have or need uh, for a Delta wave, um, uh, the vaccines? Can you comment on that question? Well, the first question we need to address is, you know, if you have a variant adapted, so an Omicron adapted uh, vaccine, would you just use it as a booster in those who had a primary series with the previous vaccine? And what would you do with people who have not had a vaccine? You know, would you start with an Omicron vaccine or would you start with the usual primary series? And my gut feeling is, and Florian, I see him nodding, <laughs> is that you still have to give the, co the coverage against the, the ancestral strains which still is working against Delta. And remember, Delta is still our current problem, not Omicron. So, but, but indeed, maybe also, um, um, Jacob, you could, could um, discuss whether it would have an, an, a knock-on knock effect on, on production, because we definitely would need to, to increase production. Um, Jacob, what is your take? Yeah, so I mean, that's, of course, a valid point. I mean, we are still struggling with production capacity for the for vaccines against the canonical uh, original strain. And then, uh, you know, we are already adapting to Omicron strains, which is probably thought to be rolled out as a booster primarily in high income countries. So th there is a lot of initiatives to expand vaccine manufacturing and fill finish capacities. Also, for example, in the African countries, um, CEPI and the African Union are engaged in this. Um, other developers have announced to expand into this, but production capacity takes time uh, to be built. Uh, so this is an important uh, issue. I also want to mention that, and we learned this again on Monday in a WHO consultation, that natural infection rates are also very high in low middle income countries or in those countries that have not yet seen a lot of vaccinations. So 70%, up to 70 or even higher proportions of the populations had been naturally infected um, without vaccine. So to understand what a variant adapted vaccine, a single dose moving forward or a combination of different platforms or different variants um, does in prime populations, populations primed by natural infection is also something that we need to look at. Yeah, and there's an additional question for uh, you. And that is if we, and that's what you said, we need much more doses um, uh, at, for the global uh, south and boosters even for the vulnerable. Uh, there's always this question, lots of discussion also in Germany about then what about this uh, patent pool and technology transfer CTAP and the TRIPS waiver? What is the situation on there? Would you, would you kind of think that uh, needs to be done more on this front or uh, isn't that the way to go? Well, it's difficult for me to comment on tech transfer or, or um, you know, to uh, lift the barriers on intellectual properties, for example. What I would like to comment on is that vaccine production is a very complex procedure. Uh, it's probably one of the drugs um, that is most difficult to produce and at high, high standards uh, and high quantities. So simply to lift kind of restrictions on intellectual properties itself is certainly not a solution. One has to secure that the vaccine production 
is maintained at a quality level everywhere, because if you start substandard vaccine production on a certain platform somewhere, it will challenge the entire platform, no matter where it is or at which standard it is being produced. And the second point I'd like to make is that there is alternative options as well, uh, rather than completely lifting intellectual properties, and that is tech transfer. So, you know, incorporation with vaccine manufacturers to start production elsewhere. And there is a lot of um, tech transfers underway, also from the AstraZeneca vaccine, for example, produced by the Serum Institute of India, Fiocruz, and other partners around the globe. So there is technologies, but uh, in the end, what is the best to achieve high vaccination production um, is uh, to, to be debated still. So. Yeah. Florian, I have a technical question for you, and that is, uh, what role will, will be uh, the as yet unapproved protein-based vaccines or could play in the international vaccination campaigns because they have some logistic, uh, yeah, maybe easier to distribute? What do you think? I mean, uh, one of them is approved in Indonesia uh, and is used in Indonesia right now, and that's the, the vaccine from Novavax that's in, in uh, the second uh, phase of, of approval in the European Union or at EMA right now. Um, there are other candidates that have good clinical results globally, Clover, for example. Uh, so these vaccines could be could be used. The question is, what's the production capacity? Can they deliver in the end? Uh, Novavax had some uh, some back and forth and some issues with, with production. Uh, so I think they can make a big impact. And I think uh, there are also uh, places that, that uh, can uh, produce them under contract in all kinds of countries. And that would be important. I think they can make a big impact. But unfortunately, a lot of, or at least one of the protein vaccines was, was, uh, you know, I wouldn't say leading the field, but was in in the in the yeah in the back of the quickest developers in the beginning, and so far uh, this has slowed down quite a bit. So I think the recombinant protein vaccines can contribute a lot, but uh, you know we still have to see their their full potential in terms of. Not in terms of the immunogenicity, that they are great and we know the clinical data, but in terms of, of getting them actually delivered and getting the doses shipped and getting the, the vaccines approved. Yeah. Uh, one question to all, uh, to all of you is, uh, what, what do you think why for certain vaccines who are given to uh, hundreds and millions of people uh, that we still do not have very good uh, clinical data from, from huge phase uh, three trials? I mean, how how... Why is that? Or do you see there is something missing? Or would you be uh, um, saying that, well, we have enough, enough data about uh, how the different types of vaccines are working, giving to many people? Annelies, maybe you start? <laughs> Not so sure what you mean, because um, any vaccine that goes for regulatory approval will need um, you know, the full clinical development assessment, phase one, two, and three, and therefore also, uh, you know, big sample sizes for phase three. So, so there's no vaccine, <laughs> it's important to say, no vaccine that will go to, to, the, to EMA or to WHO or to FDA without, without good data. Uh, some, 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 the problem for some vaccines was that they actually did have very good clinical data, but that they were um, still lacking um, high quality data for the good manufacturing process or for CMC data, and that slowed down the process. So there are various facts, every, every vaccine is different. Um, yeah. And so, so Sputnik, for example, it was delayed because of GMP issues, good manufacturing issues. So when they did a site visit, they found some problems. Uh, it was not delayed because they were lacking clinical vaccine trial data. No. Florian, do you wish any data which you have not seen on a certain vaccine which is distributed? Or would you say, well, the evidence base is quite good, we have? I think there are a number of vaccine candidates out there where it would be nice to see more effectiveness data, right? We have effectiveness data for uh, for some vaccines. There's a lot of a lot of studies. For other vaccines, there's little data. So what, what I found really good, for example, is the study that was uh, conducted in Brazil where uh, they basically looked at the whole population and compared AstraZeneca and CoronaVac. I think we need a lot of lot more studies like that, and there is data missing on 
uh, on, on some of these vaccines in terms of effectiveness. We have to be careful. Efficacy, which is measured in a clinical trial in the phase three, is actually required for approval, right? Nobody will approve without that. But what is in, also important is the effectiveness. How well does the vaccine now work in the population? So we have to make a distinction between effectiveness uh, and uh, uh, efficacy and uh, efficacy data, uh, effectiveness data for a lot yeah. of these vaccines um, is not very solid yet, and we need we need more data to to be able to cross compare. But again, that's different from efficacy and from uh, from what was measured in the clinical trials. Uh, maybe the last question before we have uh, the final question uh, is uh, for both of you, uh, Annalise and Jacob. Uh, from your perspective, what more could the vaccine manufacturers do to improve vaccine equity in the world? Jakob, you want to take the first step? Produce more vaccine. Um, help us deliver the vaccine equally around the globe. Uh, focus help us focus on those populations that are really in need of vaccinations first. So populations at risk, older adults, chronic diseases, immunocompromised. And then certainly partner with us, um, sit around the table, um, maybe advanced developers help less experienced developers sit around the table, speak with WHO, with the regulatory agencies um, in workshops, to explore ways forward um, for rapid reaction to emerging challenges, including new variants. Annalise? Totally agree with, with, with Jacob and almost nothing to add. I think, I think a commitment to COVAX to deliver on time and not when another, vex, another, another country offers a bigger price than to, you know, to, to divert uh, supplies to the bigger to those that offer more money uh, so co to keep commitments to COVAX to deliver to COVAX in time and to come down with the prices to COVAX. Okay then uh, we move on to the final question just for each of you maybe a, a short answer and uh, that will be um, Jeremy Farrar uh, just said that he thinks that we are closer to the beginning than to the end of uh, this pandemic and um, I would ask each of you what is your perspective on this some people felt that well we are now through it but it seems to be not so what is your view how it's going to uh, to proceed from here with Omicron in mind. Florian? I think I'm a little bit more optimistic, but I think what he says indirectly is we need to take this serious. And I think we need to take the current Delta wave serious and we need to take Omicron serious. And I think that's the message. Um, be nice if this would be over soon, but uh, Omicron might prolong the problem. Annelies, what is your perspective? I agree with Jeremy in many ways. Um, and that's in the sense that that we it will be very difficult to eradicate this virus. We need we need to um, so what we need to do is to do everything to protect healthcare systems and to avert deaths. Um, and we're doing that with our current vaccines. Um, and but the problem is we need to keep the society together uh, and to keep them confident in the science and for them to understand that we do need booster doses or may need to have variant adapted boosters. Um, so, but the, the, the good thing is we now know how to prevent severe deaths. We will, we will be able to have a, um, to relax some of our restrictions, but I think we, this, will, this will be with us for many, many years to come. Jacob? Yeah, it's, it's certainly not on me to disagree with Jeremy Farrar. And I see his point, uh, you know, from a timeline perspective. Um, the pandemic started pretty much two, two years ago, and we are still not at all in a position to control this pandemic. We have no idea how Omicron will emerge. But like Florian and Annalise, I'm much more optimistic, or I'm in general also optimistic, which I'm very sure Jeremy is as well. Um, in that, that we have new technologies, we have very 
well-functioning mRNA for the very first time licensed. With this technology, we can react very quickly to new variants. We have other platform technologies. We have learned a lot more about viral vector technology. We have learned a lot about combining different vector or, or sorry, uh, platform technologies and to learn you know, about advantages. We have invested in manufacturing capacity. We have invested in early warning systems. I do think we have learned a lot, not just about this pandemic, but also about future pandemics, which SEPI will certainly look into lessons learned to develop future pandemic preparedness strategies as well. So all in all, I think, yes, we're not there yet, um, but there is also a lot of room and reason for optimism. Okay, then we are cl uh, after a close uh, 50 minutes, we come to an end. I first thank your experts for your t taking your time and answering all these questions. Uh, thanks for the many questions from the journalists. Uh, we couldn't answer them all of them, um, but anyhow, we hope that we could clarify the most important issues. Uh, there will be a transcript and the video available at the Science Media Center and also at the International Vaccine Hub. And uh, with that, um, I leave you and uh, we all hope uh, that the next weeks um, will be not as bad as uh, some of us fear. Thank you again and bye. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. So what am I to say?